Hi everyone, Whitney Lowe here and welcome to another one of our Clinical Insights videos where today we're going to be focusing on subacromial impingement. Subacromial indicating of course this is going to be in the shoulder region below the acromion process of the shoulder. This is a condition that many of your clients may experience. It's a pretty common problem and there's sometimes you know, a misidentification or misdiagnosis of these problems that leads to inappropriate treatment. It's really valuable for massage practitioners to understand some of the different facets of shoulder impingement, which of the different tissues might be involved, and that will help us build a constructive strategy for an appropriate treatment protocol to address it. We'll look at some of the basic anatomical structures in this region and how they lead to this problem. So let's start off looking at this whole subacromial region and talk about some of the different structures that make up this area. So the shoulder is one of the most, well, it is really the most mobile joint in the body. And that means there's a great range of motion at that joint, but in order to maintain stability and function in that joint, you have to sort of guide that motion and also protect it from excessive movements by the soft tissue. So since there's not a lot of bony restriction to those movements, the soft tissues have to play a major role in there. And it is the architecture of the shoulder that leads to this problem to begin with. So let's point out a couple of key structures here that make up this whole subacromial space. Okay, so here we've got highlighted is the scapula. This is, of course, the chromium process of the scapula here. And then over here, the coracoid process of the scapula. Now, you'll notice in between them is this uh, ligamentous structure right here called the coracoacromial ligament. There's a very unique facet of this ligament, which is most of the times a ligament spans between adjacent bones to help create stability between those bones. But you'll notice the coracoacromial ligament is spanning between two portions of the same bone, the acromion process of the scapula and the coracoid process of the scapula. Now, if we look at the overall structures there, if we look at the acromion process, that coracoacromial ligament and the coracoid process, it, it creates sort of an arch across this way right here. So we call this the coracoacromial arch, arching all the way across here from the acromion process to the coracoid process. It's bone hard tissue here, very dense ligament here, and then the bone tissue right here. And that's sort of an archway that all of these other soft tissues underneath here have to course underneath, and they can get pressed up against the underside of that coracoacromial arch. And that is, in fact, what happens with subacromial impingement. Subacromial, of course, means below the acromion. So anytime we're having impingement problems from these structures getting compressed, and again, remember, impingement means pinching or compressing of something, we have a number of things that might get compressed underneath that coracoacromial arch. Let's take a look at what some of those major structures are. Most superficially right here, we have the subacromial bursa. So that bursa is a small fluid-filled sac that's designed to reduce friction between the top of the supraspinatus muscle and the underside of the acromion process. So that bursa is, of course, the most superficial and susceptible to it. And that's why so many people have diagnosis of bursitis in their shoulder because that bursa can become inflamed and irritated. But in many cases, there are other soft tissues that get involved there and it's not the bursa. And so what we're going to try to do is to find some ways to discriminate between some of the different tissues that are in that area to figure out what the nature of that problem really is. So underneath the bursa, of course, is the supraspinatus muscle. So this one is highly vulnerable to compression in this area. And this is, of course, the supraspinatus is one of those rotator cuff muscles. So when a person has a rotator cuff disorder or is diagnosed with rotator cuff tears, oftentimes that is the supraspinatus that is involved. And many times those tears occur as a result of repeated impingement underneath the coracoacromial arch here that causes sort of a fraying or you know, degeneration of the distal portion of that supraspinatus tendon. It's interesting that as people age, they often begin to develop sort of calcifications on the underside of the acromion process here that may cause that, that bone to, to sort of come down a little bit farther into that subacromial space. We call this a hooked acromion. It's visible on an x-ray. But that hooked acromion may be the reason for a person getting further impingement or compression of these structures underneath that coracoacromial arch. Now, from a massage and soft tissue perspective, we can't do anything about a hooked acromion, but we can have an idea if we know that that is present, that that might be a reason for somebody having some of these different symptoms. And again, part of what we do is about home care suggestions or, or education with our clients to help them understand what kinds of things they might want to do to help keep them from having something get more aggravated. 
this is a good way that you can encourage them to limit the amount of things that they do in full forward flexion of their shoulder with the arm raised up overhead or out in full abduction because those are the two positions that tend to impair or compress those tissues the most. Now right underneath the supraspinatus we also have portions of the glenohumeral joint capsule. This is often referred to as the coracohumeral ligament. There's, they're really kind of a sort of a, a blending together of those stabilizing ligaments of the glenohumeral joint and the joint capsule itself. We have the joint capsule just underneath here. So this is the outer layer of that joint capsule. But those tissues really blend together a great deal. But there's a fairly good degree of innervation to those tissues. So if they are injured, it's, it's likely that you'll have some uh, irritation or pain associated with the capsular tissues from that impingement process as well. Now, another structure potentially vulnerable to compression in this area is the tendon from the long head of the biceps brachii. So here's that biceps brachii and the tendon that you see here coursing across the top of the humeral head, taking just about a right angle turn all the way over to its attachment into the glenoid labrum. During various shoulder motions, especially those of full forward flexion, lifting the arms straight up overhead, that can cause compression of that biceps tendon right underneath the coracochromial arch here. So that's another one that we want to watch out for. Also, you don't hear about this as often, but the subscapularis muscle, you can see how the upper margin of this subscapularis right here could potentially be vulnerable to compression again when you raise the arm up overhead, especially in the extremes of forward flexion that's likely to put that a subscapularis in a vulnerable position to make it susceptible to being impinged or compressed underneath that coracoacromial arch. Now, the primary signs and symptoms somebody is likely to express if they've got subacromial impingement is some type of shoulder pain, and oftentimes people may describe this as a hard to really pinpoint and put their finger on to make it worse by pressing on it because it's deep structures that are in there, so it may be more uh, aggravated by certain motions, again, especially forward flexion motions and abduction. So if they're doing any recreational activities or occupational activities that involve a lot of forward flexion or abduction, like even we see this condition a lot in hairdressers, for example, because of the long periods that they're having to um, uh, hold their arms up in an abduct position as they're cutting hair. Um, again, various other occupational activities. We see this in uh, recreation and sporting activities. Swimmers are very susceptible to subacromial impingement because of the repeated high-velocity movements of the shoulder with significant resistance as they're pulling their body through the water. So those are all things that would lead to these kind of sensations in there that, that cause the main problems with shoulder impingement. Now, one of the things that I see happening frequently with, with attempts to identify shoulder impingement problems is that it oftentimes gets misidentified as something else. For example, I've seen a lot of instances where people were told they had frozen shoulder when, in fact, they really have some type of subacromial impingement problems. And there are some patterns that you can watch for that might be more indicative of shoulder impingement problems versus frozen shoulder. For example, if the supraspinatus muscle is involved, then a resisted shoulder abduction movement is likely to be more painful and reproduce that primary pain they've been experiencing. That won't happen in a shoulder in a frozen shoulder condition because there's no motion occurring there to stretch the involved joint capsule. So those are some things that can do that, going through various ranges of motion and comparing those patterns and looking to see what patterns are most painful is a great way to, to narrow that down and to determine if that does tend to look like one of those versus the other. Another thing to look for is in problems of adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder, there's usually a pattern of limited motion that's most evident where there's a greater degree of limitation in lateral rotation of the shoulder compared to abduction. So if that lateral rotation is really limited, that might indicate a capsular problem and not something like impingement because the lateral rotation movement, especially when done passively with the arm at the side, doesn't tend to cause that kind of discomfort for shoulder impingement because you're not compressing or pinching those structures underneath the coracoacromial arch in that, mo in that movement. Now, subacromial impingement can be treated in a variety of different ways. It's very frequently treated with conservative measures like exercise, movement modifications. A lot of the soft tissue work that we do in massage can be very helpful in reducing uh, muscular tightness and helping to restore ideal shoulder biomechanics that might lead to the problem. And again, activity modification is going to be a crucial part of this. So if there's anything that the person is doing with repeated shoulder motions or things they're doing over and over again that are likely to aggravate that 
that's going to be crucial for them. So again, having some good understanding of some of the things that may happen in this region will help you target your treatment more effectively. If there's primarily a biceps tendon that's involved and in, in causing the problem, treatment a little bit more focused on the biceps breakout may be beneficial. If it's a supraspinatus where the main problem is, work a little bit more on that supraspinatus might be particularly helpful as well. And distinguishing between some of these problems that have similar symptoms but don't necessarily indicate impingement is also going to be very helpful for you per, to construct the most ideal treatment that's going to be beneficial for your clients. So if you've got some good nuggets on shoulder impingement syndrome, be sure to click the like button and subscribe to our channel so you can keep up with other interesting videos that we'll continually put out on various soft tissue disorders and the role of massage in addressing those kinds of problems as well. Also, be sure to drop a comment in the comment section if you've got questions or anything else that you want to ask about this particular problem. We always like to hear from people and see if this kind of thing is helpful information for you. And if you want to learn some more about some of the things that we have going on over at the Academy of Clinical Massage, it'll help you learn a whole lot more about how to address, identify, and treat all these different types of soft tissue pathologies. Hop on over and grab a copy of our assessment cheat sheet, which will really help you get a good jump start on identifying what some of these problems are. You can catch that on our website at academyofclinicalmassage.com slash cheat sheet. All right, we'll see you in the next video.